Welcome to Rheumatology Highlights Report. I'm Dr. Len Calabrese from the R.J. Faisenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology. And these uh, presentations are designed in a span of 15 minutes to summarize important areas of rheumatology. These are taken from the peer-reviewed literature and recent international meetings. I'm going to start by talking about safety in biologics. Our objectives are to, to discuss some advances in the diagnosis of TB. We'll talk about B-cell depletion and chronic lung disease, talk about the important area of biologics and perioperative infections, and a few miscellaneous topics. So the first topic of TB and TNF inhibitors is kind of old, but this is such an important paper I want to draw it to your attention. It's from the Annals of Rheumatic Disease um, in late 2010 from the very powerful British Society of uh, Rheumatology Biologics Registry. So um, in this study, uh, they looked at over 10,000 patients on multiple TNF inhibitors with a control group of over 3,000 patients on DMARDs, and they wanted to look at the comparative rates of tuberculosis. From this table, you can see the dramatic differences. First of all, in the DMARDs, in uh, over 7,000 patient years, there wasn't a single case of tuberculosis. And if we now look at all TNF inhibitors, um, there were 27 cases. Uh, so the rates uh, per 100,000 uh, are clearly different. Since there were no cases in the in the uh, non-bio DMARDs, you can't really express a relative risk. But within the TNF inhibitors, um, there were cases seen with all of them, uh, but the rates were palpably higher for infliximab and adalimumab compared to a tanercept. And in this final um, uh, table, we can see that if a tanercept is the referent value, the, uh, the comparator, uh, the incident rates uh, were significantly higher for both adalimumab and infliximab. Um, uh, and the uh, time to disease was much shorter for infliximab. So our conclusion um, as what we have suspected is that the rate of TB in patients with RA on TNFs was three to four-fold higher in patients receiving infliximab and adalimumab, and much higher than non-biologic DMARDs. The good news, we have risk mitigation, we know how to screen, and we're observant for this. So let's now talk a little bit about what happened in London in uh, May of 2011. Some interesting abstracts. First one is on concomitant lung disease. You know, last year, uh, Atul Kosnas and I published a, a review on pulmonary toxicity of TNF inhibitors in the seminars of arthritis and rheumatism. And we were struck about the little-known potential complications of TNF inhibitors in people with diffuse lung disease. So this is a problem. What to do with people like this? They're not good methotrexate candidates. Um, this study from DAS um, uh, looked at... Uh, a cohort of patients with lung disease prior to receiving the B-cell depleting agent rituximab. Most of them had interstitial lung disease, some had COPD. And this was retrospective, and uh, half of them had received more than a single cycle. But at the end of this, there were three deaths, uh, including one exacerbation of COPD um, and um, uh, pneumonia. Uh, but overall, uh, the survival ship was quite uh, good. So the conclusion was is that there was no uh, significant safety signals um, uh, except for this single case. So my take-home message is, is that, that uh, while I don't think that this is ideal nor definitive from a perspective of safety, this is a better safety signal than we've seen for any other biologic agent in the setting of diffuse lung disease. Um, so it would be something that we should be thinking about. Uh, the next study by Mariette and colleagues, again, looked at the issue of malignancy and TNF inhibitors. But this is uh, not a single center or a single country study. This is a meta-analysis. So they looked at a, a large number of pooled studies. I'll show you the, um, uh, the graphs on the next slide. But um, uh, this uh, uh, found uh, that prior malignancy uh, did impart a higher risk for new and recurring malignancies, but not increased further by exposures by anti-TNFs. And like several other small studies, there, uh, the only uh, tumors that were increased were non-melanoma skin 
cancer and uh, melanoma. Uh, the pooled estimate for lymphoma was quite low. As you can see from this uh, uh, overall graph, um, that uh, there was no association with increased malignancies with TNF inhibitors. I think this is an important pay, uh, message for our patients. Now let's talk about a couple other uh, small areas of importance. One is periprosthetic joint infections. You know, in the not so old uh, medical literature, Periprosthetic infections in patients with active RA had an incidence as high as 10%. It's devastating in the area of total joint replacements, uh, but the data are the data. So the question has lingered for some time, and numerous people have attempted to answer this. Is there an increased risk of periprosthetic um, infections in patients treated with anti-TNF inhibitors or other biologics compared to conventional DMARDs. So uh, Strongfeld, uh, using the RABBIT database, this is German Biologics Registry um, um, uh, that enrolls patients with all different types of biologics in a referent uh, non-biologic DMARD control group, um, looked at everyone who had total joint replacement of the hip, knee, shoulder, and ankle. And they enrolled 118 patients in the DMARD group and 531 um, who had a prior total joint replacement prior to enrolling. And then in follow-up, um, 108 and 397 of these people um, had their first or further arthroplasty. And the next table shows the data. And there's a lot of data on here. So as you can see, um, uh, in the left-hand column are the different treatment limbs, ranging from DMARDs only to anti-TNFs, DMARDs after anti-TNFs, um, and then uh, other non-TNF biologics. We have the patient years of exposure, the number of periprosthetic infections, the periprosthetic infections within six months, the rest would be delayed, and then the rate per 1,000 uh, patient years. So first of all, I, I would say that the referent value uh, is the DMARDs only. Um, and considering um, there were um, uh, 204 patients with total joint replacements, there were only two periprosthetic infections, and these were delayed, uh, yielding a rate of about 4.9. And from there, you can see uh, that the other rates for other drugs, except for anakinra, and note that there were very small numbers in this group, were all in the same ballpark um, uh, of uh, infections. So in this uh, conclusion, it showed that the overall rate of infections was only 1%, and that was 1% in the, in the, in the uh, non-biologic DMARD group, and only 1.5% in the biologic group. There was no difference between um, any of the individual anti-TNF agents. And then they compared in this abstract uh, data from other registries, including the Danish hip and the Finnish arthroplasty, showing infection rates still hovering around this 1%. So in conclusion, in general, the rates of periprosthetic infections are low and in line with reported incidence rates. Compared to patients with conventional DMARDs, we found non-significantly increased rates uh, in these patients who probably had more severe disease, um, and there were no infections with the other non-TNF inhibitors. So what is unanswered by this? Um, do you continue the um, biologics uh, in and around surgery? Do you discontinue? I don't have to remind you that uh, there are recommendations now from uh, the ACR treatment recommendations that these drugs should be uh, discontinued for one to two weeks before and after surgery, and you probably should base the rate and timing of discontinuation on pharmacokinetic considerations, in other words, the half-life of the given drugs. But these are very, very encouraging um, uh, uh, results to me. Another difficult question um, uh, facing us, what about pregnancy and anti-TNFs? Well, at the present time, anti-TNFs are considered category B. That means that there's no animal data um, uh, uh, that have shown this uh, uh, to have an adverse effect uh, 
um, uh, on uh, reproductive health um, uh, or any significant human data. Uh, so to date, most of the studies, with except for one, uh, in 2009, uh, looking at an, uh, a large FDA AIRS database, um, have been rather reassuring. So what do we know uh, from this? And this is, uh, again, from a British Biologic Database. Um, there were overall, there were 130 pregnancies and 118 women exposed to anti-TNF. And they broke them down with those who had the drug at the time of inception, and that may uh, be with or without antimetabolites that are bad for pregnancy, like methotrexate or leflunamide, or those who were exposed prior to conception. The rates of spontaneous abortion uh, are listed here um, and are um, highest in the group that were exposed to methotrexate or leflunamide plus the anti-TNF um, and lowest in those who only had prior exposure. And of the live births, um, uh, 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 including three sets of twins, um, uh, most of them were exposure prior to the conception group. So the conclusion here, I think, is a continuing story that treatment with anti-TNF at the time of conception may be associated with an increased rate of spontaneous abortion, um, uh, but there's very little evidence that it's associated with birth defects. And guidelines would suggest that these drugs should be avoided um, at the time of conception must remain. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, there is no increasing signal of any type of birth defects with this. Um, what about, um, uh, to conclude, uh, a variation on the theme of B cell depletion and immunoglobulin levels? And I think that this is an interesting story. We know uh, from uh, examination of the long-term safety database of rituximab in rheumatoid arthritis, that even after four, five, six, seven, or more cycles, that there is very little effect on immunoglobulin isotypes in a progressive fashion. Uh, most data has shown that uh, while well, IgM may have occasional levels below the lower limit of normal and up to a quarter of a patient after multiple rounds of rituximab, less than 5% have any significant reductions of IgG. But please recall that these data are derived from rheumatoid arthritis studies. Patients largely have been pretreated with TNF inhibitors and are on low-dose uh, prednisone and methotrexate. What about now that we are using um, uh, rituximab in other settings, such as ankyposative vasculitis and off-label in diseases such as lupus, where patients may have had much more significant immunosuppressive therapy? This is a study by Effelsberg that examines the effect of rituximab in patients with ANCA-associated vasculitis, breaking into two groups. One are cytoxan-treated ANCA-positive patients um, uh, who get cytoxan alone, and the other is a comparator group who get rituxan because they are either resistant um, uh, to cytoxan or intolerant of this, um, but they were exposed to cytoxan. And then we have a comparator group of rituxan-treated RA patients. And I think this graph um, or chart tells us a lot. If you look at first, the effects of cytoxin on IgG levels is pretty significant, going from levels of about 1,200 milligrams per DL to about levels of 900, but still well within the normal range. But now when you look at rituximab given to patients with previous uh, um, cytoxin exposure, the levels fall by nearly 50%. Uh, and this is dramatically different from patients in the third um, column who receive rituximab in the setting of RA. So, um, uh, and similarly, if you look to the right, similar effect on IgM. So from this, my take-home message um, is uh, uh, issued in this last si slide, um, that in patients with ANCA-associated vasculitis who had previous cytoxan exposure, uh, rituximab can knock down immunoglobulin significantly. And in my practice, I'm checking uh, uh, immunoglobulins at baseline in all such patients. So I don't think that in uh, finality that we can take all the lessons about B-cell depletion from rheumatoid and roll them over to other diseases. 
So these are just a, a few tidbits on safety. There's so much there. It's so hard for us to keep up on this literature. Uh, we'll be uh, posting this uh, now, and it'll be up for about six months, and then we're going to uh, have another round of advances in safety uh, sometime uh, later this year. I'd like you to come back to Rheumatology Highlights Report. There are 15 other topics up, 15 minutes at a time. Do it when a patient cancels. Do it at lunch. Um, give us 15 minutes, and we'll give you the world of rheumatology.